A time lapse is a super cool way to show the passage of time. How hard are those things to make? I'm going to tell you all about it on today's episode of Ask David Bergman. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. Here I am, as always, answering your photography questions. Don't forget to go to AskDavidBergman.com. Ask your photo questions right there on the site. I just might pick it to answer here on a future show. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Adorama YouTube channel. If you're not already a subscriber, go ahead and click that button down below. Use the little bell icon. You'll be notified as soon as new photo shows come out all week long from myself and the other photo hosts right here on Adorama TV. Today, I've got a question sent in from Byron B, and he wants to know... How do you do time-lapse photography? Thanks, Byron, for sending that in. It's a pretty straightforward question. Uh, the thing about time-lapses is there's really more than one way to do it. And what I'm going to do in this video is tell you the way that gives you the most quality and control, and then I'm also going to give you a super easy, fun way to do one as well. Now, time-lapses are like the old-fashioned flip books where you flip through the pages and the images come to life, right? What you're gonna do photographically is shoot a lot of photos in sequence and then play them back very quickly. At that point, once you start playing them back, it's really it really becomes a movie or a video. Those are simply made up of a lot of individual frames, just like we're doing here today, and usually played back traditionally at 24 or 30 frames a second, or even 60 frames a second. So we're gonna emulate that with still photographs. Now, I'm sure you've seen time lapses done for beautiful landscape shots where the clouds are rolling across the plains, right? Now, I'm not a landscape photographer, so I haven't really done many of those, but I have done time lapses when I'm out on a concert tour, for example, to show the process of setting up the stage. That's a really cool thing to see how that all comes together over an entire day compressed down into 10 seconds or so. I also have done one, uh, I did one when in my studio down in Brooklyn when we unpacked and set up my giant Canon Pro 4000 printer. I really wanted to document that process. And so a time lapse was the perfect opportunity to do that. Now, if you want to make your own time lapse, really the first thing you want to do, and this is often overlooked and one of the biggest mistakes people make is you want to pre-visualize your shot. You want to imagine what the final video is going to look like and try to find the place to put your camera so that you make actually an interesting video. It can't just be, you know, a shot of me sitting here in the studio. Nobody cares about that. It's not going to look that interesting, uh, you know, as far as a time lapse goes. So try to pre-visualize what it is you want to do and make it an interesting video at the end of the day. Now, once you've decided where you want to put the camera, you need to stabilize it. You want to get it locked down, ideally on a tripod. If you don't have a tripod, you could use something, a floor plate like the Platypod is one of my favorites. To, instead of a tripod, it's really uh, easy to travel with. It's very small, fits in your camera bag, and you always can have it with you. Or you could use something like a super clamp and a magic arm. I use those a lot when I'm on tour for remote cameras, so I usually have those with me, and I can always find something to clamp my camera down to to do a time lapse. Even at the very bare minimum, you want to put the camera down on a ledge or on the ground. The camera can't be moving. You can't obviously handhold it while you're doing a time lapse because you're going to be shooting over a long period of time and you want it to be as stable and still as possible. Now then what you're going to do is you're going to automatically trigger the camera and the, the way to do that is to use what's called an intervalometer. Um, so a lot of cameras have one built in where you can set all the parameters. You set the number of frames and the interval between each one and then you can just set it and forget it and the camera will go ahead and shoot those frames in the sequence you program. If your camera doesn't have one built in, there are external in intervalometers that you can buy. Canon makes one for the Canon cameras that don't have it where it's basically like the cable release cord and it has all those functions built in so that you can do it that way. It's a really nice thing to have with you just in case. Now, as far as the camera settings you're going to use, you want to have everything on manual. Here's the thing. You don't want anything to change from frame to frame. Your exposure, your focus, even your white balance, you want those to be consistent all the way across. So shutter speed, aperture, ISO, all of those things you want to set. And again, focus too. If you can go to manual focus and lock in your focus, if you know somebody walks right in front of your camera and you're on uh, autofocus and the camera zips out to focus on them, it's going to look so weird when you put that all together in one sequence. So you want to preset focus. Now as far as white balance, if you are shooting raw, which I highly recommend, you could go auto white balance. White balance doesn't really matter that much because you're going to, you know, fix it afterward when you set, when you do your raw conversions. I prefer to always shoot in raw for that control. That way I can really 
tone my images that I can change the color and the contrast and make them look exactly how I want to look. And then all I have to do is set one image how I want and then I can batch process all of them. Even if it's thousands of images with one click, I can apply those settings to all of them and they're going to look exactly the same. But, but you can't fix exposure or focus after the fact. So lock those in on manual and you'll be good to go. As far as shutter speed, you actually have a creative decision to be made. If you want to shoot with a faster shutter speed, the action, if there's a lot of action movement, it's going to be very fast and very jumpy and kind of choppy. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is a very specific kind of a look. If you slow down your shutter speed some more, the motion is going to be a little more fluid and it's going to, it's going to flow a little more. Um, I did a video in Times Square where I showed the difference between different shutter speeds and I did one at 500th of a second and that's really that jumpy, you know, has that jumpiness. I did it at a 30th of a second where things start to slow down, the people start to flow a little more and then I did one with each frame at a one second uh, shutter speed and that obviously has a lot more fluidity and the people are almost floating through the scene like ghosts. So. Uh, it's really just a creative decision. If, by the way, if you want to shoot at a second, you probably are going to have to use a neutral density filter on your camera to be able to get that long of a shutter speed in daylight if you're out in the middle of the day to be able to get that uh, one second exposure at a low ISO and the aperture that you want. So that's your decision with shutter speed. But again, everything's got to be manual once you're locked in. Now, how many frames do you want to shoot and how long will it take? Well, that you need to calculate. So if you're going to run the final video back at 30 frames a second, and again, traditionally you want to go 24, 30, or 60, 30 is generally a good way to go. That's the most common for video. So that obviously means you need to shoot 30 frames for every second that you want in your final video. So if we calculate that out for 10 seconds of video, that's 300 frames that you need to photograph, right? So um, the other factor to consider is the interval between each picture that you take. Do you want to shoot a picture every second? Maybe more, maybe less. It really depends on what you're shooting. Um, in Times Square, there's a lot of fast motion, right? It's frenetic energy. There's people, you know, running around all over the place, moving quickly. Normally, maybe now it's a little uh, quieter there, but normally it's very, very busy. Although it's getting that way again here in Times Square, but. Um, so for a situation like that, it's probably best to do maybe one frame a second or even every half a second, right? Two frames a second. Remember, we're going to need 300 frames for 10 seconds of video. So if you do a frame every second, that means you need to shoot for 300 seconds or that, that comes out to five minutes. Um, now for landscapes where you're just showing the movement of clouds and you don't have people running around, you could probably slow that down and shoot a frame every five or 10 seconds, maybe even more. Um, that's going to obviously take much longer to shoot, but you probably want to show the scenery changing over a few hours instead of just a few minutes like I would do in, in Times Square. Now that's kind of the basics of how you do it, um, but we can take this to the next step. Uh, if you are working just on a tripod, Time-lapse is fine, but it's very static, right? If you want to bring your time-lapses to the next level, um, static time-lapse is going to be fine in most cases. But if you move the camera, you can actually make the, your time-lapse much more dynamic. Now, uh, I'm not talking about hand-holding moving. I'm talking about slow movements so that the final video has some motion to it. Now, the first thing, again, like you pre-visualize as a still image, you also want to plan that move because it does take a long time to, to do. Once you set it up, you don't want to have to, you know, redo it many, many times, especially if you're doing a landscape, right? So make sure you pre-visualize and plan that move out. I did a video a few years ago with some of the products from a, com a company called Syrup, S-Y-R-P, and they make some cool little devices that really make this super easy. Um, the first thing I did was a simple pan using the Genie Mini, which basically it just pans left to right while the camera is in one place. Um, but then you could add in the pan tilt kit that they have to make things a bit more interesting. Now you have a two axis movement that you can do. So you can move left, right, and up, down at the same, you know, in the same time and create a little more interesting movement. Then you could also add a Genie and even a slider to get some more complex three axis movements where you combine pan, tilt and slide. You can actually move the camera 
back and forth and get some slides in there. I even, for that video, I used their slingshot system and ran my camera slowly overhead along cables between two flagpoles. Yes, in Times Square, it was kind of crazy and it was super fun to do. Uh, I had permission to do it. I'm gonna link to that video down below if you wanna watch that complete setup how I did that. But it's definitely something to think about, about getting some motion in your videos. Uh, and you have to do that by slowly moving the camera between each still frame. Now, after I've got my photos, you've done all of that, I'm gonna take the extra step, like I said, to convert everything from raw, but whether you shoot JPEGs or raw files, uh, you wanna, if you, if you shoot raw, you wanna export into JPEGs to compile that final video. Now, stills are usually higher resolution than video, so you can absolutely shoot, go high def, you know, create a high def video. 4K is pretty easy, even 8K. Uh, if you're shooting with a camera that's around 34 megapixels or more, you're gonna be able to do an 8K time lapse if you want to do that. It's gonna be, it's gonna take a lot of processing power to, uh, to run that thing, but if you can do it, it's, they're kind of awesome. Um, but then you need to put the images together to actually create a video, and there are lots of ways to do that. You can use a video editing program like Final Cut Pro or Premiere. Um, there is plenty of dedicated software. If you Google it, there's lots of dedicated software to do, uh, you know, put together all these time lapses. You can use Photoshop. Did you know that Photoshop can actually work with videos? Um, what you do is select the first image when you're opening it, and then check the little box that says image sequence, and that'll just open it like any other video would in Photoshop. For, for me personally, I'm a Mac user. I like to use QuickTime Player. If you have a Mac, you have that. You can just do open image sequence and it will compile it. You can pick how many frames per second you want and it'll compile it all together very quickly and easily. And then you just export your video at the frame rate you want and voila, you've got your time lapse. Some cameras even have a built-in time-lapse mode that's gonna compile the images for you and then just spit out a video. I still like the control of doing it myself in the computer with individual still images, but that's definitely an easy way to get it done if your camera has that function. Now, at the beginning of this video, I said there are multiple ways to do this and there is one more cool way. It's gonna cost you a little bit of extra money, but you can use a 360 degree camera for this also. I recently bought the Insta360 ONE X2. It's a super little fun camera that allows me to shoot stills and video in 360. Now what that means is you just put the camera wherever you want, but you don't have to think about where to point it. It has 180 degree lenses on both sides, so it literally captures everything in all directions. Now specifically for a time lapse, you can use the photo interval mode to shoot individual still images and then compile them after the fact. It actually allows you to shoot raw files too, so you can work on them before you put them all together if you want to. Now, it does also have a built-in time-lapse mode where it does just about everything for you. That's what I used today when I was sitting outside at Columbus Circle. It was kind of an overcast day, but I had never done a time-lapse with this thing and I wanted to give it a shot. Um, and it came out pretty nicely. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy to do. But what really makes uh, it cool by shooting it this way is since you're capturing the entire 360 degree view, you can reframe your video after the fact. That means you can pan and tilt and even zoom in a little bit in post. You can do that after the fact. So you don't have to decide what you wanna feature in your video until after the shoot. I actually didn't realize how interesting the reflections of the clouds would be in these buildings when I was out shooting. So once I saw it on the computer, once I got back to my studio, I could create a video that starts down at the bottom and then slowly moves up to reveal those reflections. I can do anything I want. I can even turn all the way around and show myself sitting there waiting for the time lapse to finish. So it's super cool and fun to play with. Now, a little camera like this isn't gonna have nearly the same image quality as a DSLR, of course. This thing's got a very small sensor compared to my full frame Canon bodies, but for a quick, fun time lapse, especially if it's only gonna be viewed on a small screen like a phone, it's a great way to go. And the Insta360 ONE X2 has a lot more cool features than just a time lapse, so if you're gonna use some of those other things, it's absolutely a good investment. So, Byron, those are the primary ways to make a time lapse. Have you all made some? Have you made time lapses before? What method did you use and how did it turn out? I wanna know, let me know down in the comments below. And remember, if you want your questions answered on this show, just like Byron did, go to askdavidbergman.com and fill out that form and uh, hopefully I'll pick it on a future show. Thanks so much, I'll be back here with a new question every Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern. I hope you'll join me next week right here on Ask David Bergman. <laughs>